The Fire Store, equipping protectors with passion. Every decision the Fire Store makes is about you, the customer. They wouldn't be where they are today without you, and they don't take that lightly. They understand that having the right gear can mean the difference between life and death. The goal is to get you the gear you need, when you need it, at prices you can afford. Visit them at thefirestore.com for everything but the truck and shop the family of brands that include Streamlight, MSA, Lion, Fleer, and more. I've been told by everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of exposure four. Got fire through the roof of the fire area, the entire rear section. Now, remember, give us a payday. It's in the county for okay? 610B, that was the main gate, 610B. I'm out uh, here, we got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling, fire shown from the second floor, give me a second alarm on this. Hang up to the top floor, I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke, go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. We got people on the front fire escape here with windows centered below them, we need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up now. Second alarm, I got a one-story single-family frame. Heavy fire showing from the attic. So we use it all here. We got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor. Second line being stretched. Primary switches are underway. Hey, welcome to Fire Engineering's podcast at Command Post. I'm Chief Rick Lassie, along with my teaching partner and best friend, Chief John Salka. And I think we've got another great show for you today. We make this stuff up. <laughs> As we go along, um, hey, quick reminder, we try to remind you about our hump day hangouts at fireengineering.com. Uh, we've got our group. Um, our group has the third Wednesday of every, every month at noon central time uh, with our good friends, uh, uh, Chief Scott Thompson and our, our co-host, uh, Chief Terry McGrath from Louisville. Um, and uh, once in a while, Chief Rhodes, the boss, will join us. A uh, reminder about FDIC, we try to do this all the time. It is in April. John and I will be doing our old favorite buddy, Five Alarm Leadership, Real Leadership, Real People, on uh, Monday uh, for our workshop. And we're doing that, folks, because of you. Uh, you have, you've been asking us for years. We did it for years there a long time ago. And pretty much every year, John, people catch us in the hallways and they're like, when are you guys bringing Five Alarm Leadership back? It's in your book and all this stuff. So. Uh, we've it got is. that it's coming away. Program. It's a popular that's program. It. Everybody likes it. Yep. Oh, that's it. And then um, uh, Wednesday, after opening ceremonies, we'll be doing a Three Degrees of May Day. And then, folks, we always remind you, if you're looking for us, if we're not in the Columbia Southern University booth or with the Dingus Fire, uh, our Dingus Fire family, then their booth will be sitting at the book booth, just looking for you to, to visit and get caught up. As always, if you're looking to attend one of our classes, uh, best way, if you want to see John and I together, is go to my website at chieflassie.com. Anything that's open to the general fire service population, I post. So you'll see John and I on there. And uh, if not, he's all over the place as well. And if you look at the host one, give us a shout. Either one of us uh, will give you our emails at the end of the show. And we'll be happy to come out and uh, spend some time with your group, talking shop and uh, doing our thing. So, hey. Um, John, one of the one of the topics, buddy. We we talked about this just before going live, uh, that we've had kind of in the back of our head for a while. In fact, I think you're going to be teaching a class on Long Island coming up on this very topic, uh, yep. preparing to ride the front seat. So, the company officer or the acting company officer um, preparing to ride the front seat. And uh, I've already got a bunch of stuff buzzing in my head, buddy. That I want to ask you, but. Um, uh, your first, your initial thoughts on preparing to ride the front seat. What's that? <laughs> sorry, you caught me. You caught me drinking some coffee. Your initial thoughts on preparing to ride the front seat. Well, actually, it's interesting because the first thing that you mentioned is is a whole separate is a whole separate issue that a lot of times people wander past without discussing. Officer. Versus like an acting officer or an aspiring officer, uh, be, because it's it's different. Like if you're in a volunteer fire company, um, you get an alarm and, and five guys show up, but none of them are officers on that particular day for that particular run, which you are and I am volunteer fire, fire as, as many, many other people are, many of our listeners are. <clears throat> you know this. You could have to staff and man a rig, and the guy that jumps in the front seat might not be an officer or ever have been an officer. And it, that's a harder job. You still got the same job to do, 
but he but but it's a little more difficult for him because he doesn't have that experience. Now, a guy who is an officer, you know, he's broken in a little bit already. Maybe he's already had some training. Maybe he had to have a an officer, you know, fire officer one or something after he got promoted or after he ran and and, and won the position in the volunteer fire department. Maybe he wouldn't got that. But but some guys just don't have it, aren't interested in it, and they just happen to be the senior man in the volunteer firehouse today, and they they jump on the front seat, and say, "Let's go, guys." You know, there is some there is some responsibility jumping in that front seat, whether you've been trained or not, particularly on the volunteer end. The, the the paid end, it's true too. But but I have I have been on apparatus in New York City where the truck officer was injured at a fire. We get back, truck officers on medical leave. They take the engine officer in the FDNY, put him on the truck. Make him the truck officer because he's already an officer. Now the engine is sitting there without an officer. Now if they find one somewhere, they may find an SA officer and bring him in. But if not, they make the senior firefighter in the engine the acting officer for the rest of the tour. Just for the rest of the tour. But I've been on ridge where the senior guy got up out of his back seat in the crew compartment, jumped up in the front seat, and suddenly there he was in an FDNY engine with zero, zero training, zero experience. But that's the system there. So I just wanted to bring that point up that that there's different people that ride in that front seat that, uh, you know, have, have a better capability or better background at being an officer. Well, and, and for our viewers that are watching this today or tonight, or, you know, like I said, these are, you know, we're, we're, we're first showing is always in the evening and then it, it plays out. You can uh, click on the link and watch it anytime with your guys. Um, but John, you know, and we're going to talk more about this later for our viewers. That's where I'm going with this is a couple more of the differences between the volunteer officer and the, and the career officer riding the front seat. We always say leadership's leadership, fires are fires. You know, we just talked about our good friend Tom Merrill's book, The Professional Volunteer Firefighter. We're both professionals. One gets paid, one doesn't. But like you said, there are some there are some differences. I know uh, um, I got a great volunteer fire department. You know it. You know the guys. You know my chief, Ryan Fetzer. Um, great, great roster. But there are times you know, I'm driving there. I'm driving the engine to an EMS call, and I've got an 18 year old firefighter sitting next to me. He's a good kid, but you know, he's not an officer and all that stuff. So there are those challenges. But I guess, John, let me let me ask you this. This is one of the one of the first questions I had in my head because I know where I was at in my career when I was first thinking about promoting. You know, about the, you know, one day, one day I'd like to, I'd like to be the you know, the, you know, the company officer or whatever that kind of thing. When did you first start? Because you were you were a volunteer, and you did a, a short stint in Titusville, Florida, and then you got hired in the FDNY. And I know we both got promoted young. When did you first start? I don't want to say truly, but really thinking. You know, everybody thinks, "Hey, one day I'd like to twenty whatever." When did you start thinking of promoting? And and what what got you? You know, there's a lot of people that ask those questions in class. Like, I never really thought. Or when do you know? You, when do you know it's right for you? When should you start? thinking about studying and all that. What, when did you start thinking about promoting to lieutenant? Let's just talk about this in the FDNY. Well, well, I mean, in the FDNY, I thought about getting promoted lieutenant before I got on the job. You know, I swear to God. It was uh, my buddy and I, Richie Bonnets, we, we, we were in Titusville, as you said. We were volleys in Mineola out in Long Island, and, and we, we left and, and ventured down to Florida and got on the job. We were, we were career guys down there for a couple of years. And although when I was down there – I didn't think about being an officer because I knew I wasn't staying, really. I was going to stay for a couple of years. I know I was waiting to go back for the FDNY. But but even back then, we were looking at the FDNY and, and pictures and movies and books and stuff like that. And I always had an image of myself someday, you know, riding the front seat, someday being an officer. And actually, they, they, they kid me about it. I remember, with, I think it was their 20th or the 25th anniversary. We had a little reunion of our class. We didn't have very many guys in my probie class in the FDNY. It was 60. And, and there was only about 20 or 25 guys showed up there. We had lost a couple, two or three guys in the line of duty, and, and a couple of guys had retired and just didn't show up. And But uh, a couple of them were kidding around, and frankly, I don't remember it, but a couple of them said, oh, yeah, we used to call you the Chief. That was your nickname. That was your nickname at Proby School, the Chief, because you, you were always talking about, you know, you're going to be a Chief someday, you know? So, <laughs> Well, it, it, what's funny about that is is your son, James the Marine, the major in the Marine Corps, what, what, what he was a lieutenant. What was his marine? What was his marine? What was marines calling him? The general. The general. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I know he's not going to be, but, uh, <laughs> but but anyway, yeah. So you know, and listen, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what fire department you're in. I, I always like to tell guys you should have some aspirations. You should, 
you should at least entertain that idea and think about, gee, I wonder how I would do. I wonder if I could make a difference. I wonder if that would be a good job. If nobody wanted to be an officer, it would be pretty hard recruiting people, right? Uh, or maybe you'd end up with the wrong people there for the wrong reason or, or whatever it was. That's the one thing about the volunteer fire department is there's no pay raise. You know, the guys that run for lieutenant or run for captain or whatever the different positions are, most of the time in a volunteer fire department generally want to be officers, you know. In, in a career department, some most guys do as well, but there's always that there's always that the pay raise and, and, the, and the heightened pension and stuff like that, that that comes along with it. I must admit, and I know I can safely speak for everybody in my study group, you know, Ralph Fago and, and, and Jay Jonas and Billy Byer and, and the whole rest of them. Um, we never, ever talked in study group about raises or about how much more you make or about what the pension will be or, or any of that. Frankly, I never really thought about it. We, we were genuinely studying and preparing to be officers because we wanted to be officers. We wanted to be a lieutenant. Then we wanted to take the next step and be a captain and have our own company, which is, you know, be a company commander and, and that. And uh, so, so it's good. Is, is it for everybody? And you know the answer to that question. Absolutely not. Being an officer is not for everybody. And I thank God that everybody doesn't want to be an officer. Why? And, it, you know, some guys are giggling, thinking, yeah, less, less competition, right? No, because some guys are just great, great firefighters. They're great behind the nozzle. They're great on the turntable. They're great senior chauffeurs. They're great. They do everything wonderfully. They become great senior men and break junior firefighters in, in a wonderful way that an officer might maybe not be able to do. So everybody's got a path in the fire service. And, uh, you know, I'm glad I took the path that I took as, as you are. And, and being an officer was very rewarding. It was difficult at the time. There were some difficult days, as we know. We'll talk more about that. But uh, all in all, it was, it was the best thing I ever did. Well, and, and you mentioned the money thing. And I, and I know some people are going to disagree. I, I tell you one thing. They're not listening to this show. The people that are into it for just a paycheck don't listen to shows like this. They're off there doing something because the firehouse is the part-time job to them. But I remember sitting with a group and, you know, these three guys got promoted lieutenant and, they're, we're having dinner. It's kind of a celebration thing. And, and the one guy just kept going on. He can't believe I never thought I'd be making this much money in my life. And this, and I'm like, yeah, but, and every, and, and I remember two of the other guys were talking about, you know, when they get to their firehouse and there's always things that, like I said, you know, as a chief, even as a chief, when, when my boss Donna said, you know, what kind of, what kind of, what kind of chief do you like working for? And I explained, she was, what kind of chief do you not like working for? I said, the one I just worked for. You know, I, I've got all these ideas on, you know, how I'd want to make the place better. Not like I'm going to put my thumb down that stuff. I'm talking, you know, as a company officer, you know, I, I want to be better. We want to go. We want to get out the door quick and all this stuff and so on and so forth. And all. it never was about the money. But you and I also were, you know, were volunteers. We're still volunteers. And I think people that do both like that, you know, look, it's nice to get, it's nice to get extra money in your paycheck. I get that and pay the bills and move up and do what you do. But I'll never, I'll never forget. You said that. And I, I think of this guy all the time. Just sit, he was so focused on just the money that, uh, hey, I mean, like, that me, guy, like that guy that you were in a rig with the time says, you're looking at the wrong book. The only book that matters is the checkbook. Remember that guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Henry Topol was like, here, you know, a great guy, L Lieutenant Henry Topol, like 36 years in the job, whatever, when I was working for him. And there's like 10 of us in that firehouse that day. And I'm studying, uh, you know, I'm a young firefighter paramedic. I'm studying one of the IPSTA books for one of the certifications. And he, away from the firehouse, he was a great guy. He still is. Great, great guy. In the firehouse, he was a, he was a gigantic jackass. And I don't care if he's listening. It, it, everybody knows what I'm talking about. And he came, like you said, he came over to me waving that checkbook. Go, this is the only book that's important, Lasky, the checkbook. He goes, I'm here for finance, not romance, brother. And I'm like, well, thanks for that rah-rah talk there, Lieutenant. Thanks for support. Yeah. I always tell this story, John. I'm driving them a couple months later, and we're going to the Shell Oil Refinery. One of the solvent racks is going in. And you, and you can see the column of smoke, and you know me being the hazmat geek, right? And I'm driving the pumper, and he's sitting there. He's he's doing one of these, and he's look, he looks at me and goes, all right, what do you think, Lask? And I, I swear to God, I'm like this. I don't know, Henry, wrong book. And he goes, don't you F at me now. And I'm like, in my head, I'm going, oh, now it's important. Now, now it's important. You know, I mean, I just, you know, so for me, I, I was kind of that way too, where I, you know, I thought young about doing it, but I was so into the job as a firefighter. It, I didn't spend much time thinking about it. I mean, you know, when you first get promoted or you first get hired, yeah, just like you, I'm going, hey, one day I'd like to be lieutenant or captain or, you know, battalion, whatever. 
but you're so busy being into the job as a firefighter and learning and having fun and breaking windows and spray that for the first few years for me, it was not even like really there. And, and then like you and I've talked about, and, and we both re- refer to it as that fire service maturity thing, which I'm going to ask you a question about that later. You know, where you all of a sudden, I remember the fire, John, that I was in the front seat. We're going to a bridge you next to us about one thirty in the morning and a house fire. And everything changed for me. I, I, I'm on the way there. And, and usually, you know, you're in the back seat, go, woohoo, you know, we got a job and all this. And, I, and for me, I'm riding going, okay, it's a one story ranch. I know we got exposure problems. There's snow on the ground. I know where the hydrants are at. We pull up. Okay. We're good. They gave us the roof. We're good. I'm already looking going, everything changed for me. Cause I went from being, you know, look, I still love that. I'm still excited about getting a job, but my train of thought was different because I was riding the front seat. You know, all of a sudden now, you know, there, there, I wasn't, there, there's, you know, I'm not sitting there high five and woohoo and getting excited. I'm thinking tactics, strategy, you know, for this, when they were, they told us, they gave us the roof. I'm already thinking, I know we're going to throw the ladder. I know I'm going to do this. Yeah, we can get up there just as quick as dimensional mental lumber. The whole thing changed for me. Absolutely. Um, that, yeah, you're thinking, you know, you know, my first do or my second do and things like yeah. that. And when you were in the backseat, you just said, come on, hurry up. Let's, let's, let's be 75 in. Let's, let's get first two. And in the meantime, now when you're in the front seat, you're thinking, you know, and in my job, there's always a little competition, especially when the companies that are close to each other that are busy, you know, beating each other in or whatever. But but, but there's rules and there's, there's things to follow there, you know. So suddenly you're in the front seat trying not to step on anybody's toes, but trying to make you guys happy, trying to get in quick and get more of the fly, but really not trying to maybe – piss off the captain of the neighboring engine that you know and you like and stuff like that. So there's, there's a there's a whole table full, a whole wheelbarrow full of stuff that you never thought of when you were riding in a crew compartment that suddenly you're thinking about when you're riding in the front seat. Exactly. Your 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 role has changed. And, and I've like I said, I've got about three things I want to get ask you about that, but I want to ask you something first. And so – I know, and we could talk about this as well. That when you with with your business, the schools you used to teach to help the, the promotional schools. But asking John Salka, because you know, I've heard guys ask. I've, I've been in class with you, buddy, where they come up and they come up to the table and they ask you specifics. They're thinking about promoting, or it's a company officer cameo. They're not there yet. What did you do to prepare? You know, we talked about when did you you know ask you the question right? When, when did you start thinking about promoting? But what did what did Johnny Salka do to prepare to, to be the company officer? I'll, I'll tell you, it's it, it's interesting, and there's a lot to it. I'll, I'll I'll you know I'll shorten it a little bit, abbreviate a little bit if I can. Uh, we got seven uh, hours. Because, don't worry about it. Only because <laughs> the FDNY system, the FDNY system of promotion, the civil service system, it's not so 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 unique that nobody's anywhere near it. But but it, but it's pretty pretty unique. At least it was then. I and, and I'm hearing rumors now that it's not even quite as competitive now as it was back then. But what you got to do is you got to make a decision, and that's the biggest decision. I'm gonna study. Um, it's not like a part time thing where you say, yeah, you know, I got that really good book from uh, Leo Stapleton. I'm, I'm gonna start reading it, and you read it on one night tour, and you leave it on your front seat of your car for a couple of for a week. You don't get back to it again, and they say, you know what, that's pretty pretty slow tonight. Let me, let me read another chapter. That's not what studying is. Studying in the FDMY is a, is a, a personal dramatic commitment to using a lot of your spare time, both at work and at home, studying and following a schedule. Most guys join a study group as well. They get two or three or even four guys together that, that are, have a similar attitude as they do, that are into it. They have to, you have to be equally into it. You, know, you can't have a guy that's dragging this, and not making a meeting. This is studying for how long of it, how, how many, I want to say this ahead of time, how many questions were on the test for lieutenant? Generally, it changes over the years. Sometimes they throw something in and take something out. Sometimes they do some in-basket questions, even though they're just a question with four choices. Sometimes they add paperwork that you have to look at. At one point in, in one of the ranks, they added a, an interview. But for the most part, it's a hundred question, wow. multiple choice, you know, situation. And, and I used to say that it, for Lieutenant and Captain and even Battalion Chief, you're studying a pile of books in the FDNY, literally a four foot high pile of books. These are not, these are not textbooks that you can go buy from fire engineering. These, these are fire department produced manuals on technical stuff, uh, operations, a lot of company, uh, you know, administrative overtime, 
all the stuff, you know, medical leave, vacation, how to balance. You have to know everything. You have to know about, oh, my God, I don't know what the number is. A couple of well, hundred thousand pieces of information and, to and get to 100. This is where, and I know because you recite stuff like this from, from the policies, and I always sat there and said, I know they had to be a test question that the nothing shall, what is it about the roof man? Nothing shall deter. Nothing shall deter the roof man from, right. Nothing shall deter the roof man from gaining his position on the roof. That's right. <laughs> that, there, there you go. I, I know that's got to be a test question. because well, I'll tell you another thing. thing. Not only did we have questions, but we had cards and we had these little code books. So we made up a lot of codes and acronyms. We had, oh my God, we might've had a hundred, maybe, maybe 150 acronyms on how to remember the five things that you do with LDH, the, the, the three ways to repair, you know, charge a battery properly. And one of them was for the, for the, uh, for the, uh, the placards on vehicles, the vehicle placards. And, and, and the, the sentence that I always remember, and I remember it to this day, if I'm driving along the road and I see a truck with a placard on it, a red placard, and down at the bottom is a number three, I know it's a liquid because my code was every good lieutenant standard operating procedure roll call expert. And it was every explosives, good gas, lieutenant, liquid. And, and I could go through the whole thing. I could recite it to you. And to this day, I still use it a little bit because when I see a placard on the road, I, I go through that sentence. And we had hundreds of those for the sequence that you get to the roof when you're the roof man, what the primary way, what the secondary way, what the, what the third way was to go. So, so without interrupting the story, we would literally start studying. Jay Jonas, myself, Ralph Fagel, we were young firefighters with about – Three or four years on the job. Now, you might be thinking we're, we're jumping the gun there. Three or four years, we knew we probably weren't going to get promoted for years. By the time you take the test, the test is specifically designed and leans towards senior people. If you're senior, you get extra points on the test just for being senior. So we were junior guys. We had no seniority. We were going to have to score even higher. We could write probably 10 points higher with five years on the job than a guy with 15 years on the job, and he'd get promoted two years ahead of you. Even if he wrote ten years, ten points below you on the written test, the way they, the way their seniority is is included in, in the in the markings, we would study for two and a half or three or three and a half years, years, years. years. And not only would you read, not only would you practice at home, then you'd go to your study group meeting once a week at a volunteer firehouse or at one of the guys' homes or wherever. And then you would join, you would pay for one of these study schools. At the time, it was Fire Tech. There was only one. Modern Fire Tech was the name of the school, run by a couple of chiefs. It was a fantastic school. that had all the best, brightest lieutenants and captains studying guys that were students, quote unquote students. And they were the instructors. I later became an instructor for them. Jay Jonas did as well. We became, you know, after we were lieutenants and we and we had a couple of years in right. So you'd go to school as well. You'd pay a you'd pay a fee every every couple of months. So you'd go to school one night a week. You'd go to study group one day a week, and you'd study your tail off. Every extra minute at the firehouse and at home for several years just to make just to pass, not just to pass. Nobody wants to just pass. You want to you want to pass and be at the top right. of the list. But I remember John, Donnie Haid, our good friend Donnie Haid, right? Just retired from the rescue talent with 42 years. I remember him saying when he was go when he was, you know, captain, he goes, I studied for years to be a lieutenant. And when I did pass and I went, okay, in the next couple of years because it takes a while to run through that list i'm gonna get promoted he goes i took about a month off and i started studying for captain already he goes i Absolutely. wasn't even a lieutenant yet i wasn't even a lieutenant yet and i started studying for captain and some guys john and i want that I'm depends on the, on the scheduling of the exams yeah 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 and i and i, I want to throw this because to our viewers again you watching this right now th that doesn't sound as crazy to think because you know, you and I have always said, I actually wrote about it in Pride and Ownership. I have a, a chapter, you know, about changing shirts, the promotion, you know, that for some people, they wake up and they go, somebody pinned this stuff on me. What happened? I woke up in my recliner. And other guys, when they get promoted, all they do is put a different shirt on. And you know what? Because they've been playing the role. They've been preparing. When they act up, they truly act up. It's not like play acting. You know, they're doing all that. And, and and we've always talked about prepare. It's actually a bullet point in our program. Prepare to promote early in your career. You should always be reaching for the next level. It doesn't mean you're egotistical or operating out of your, you know, punching out of your class, that kind of stuff. I'm a huge believer, John, in 
don't sat even if you have no desire to promote, don't satisfy where you know just because that's more knowledge. And and if anything, John, correct me if you if you don't uh, agree with me, studying to be a lieutenant, you know when, when when you're when you're doing that, gives you a window into their world. You know, you know what I'm saying is to when you're acting up and when you're studying. So when you're acting up as an officer, I don't want to do it. You know, for, and then you study, you go, you know, holy shit, I didn't realize this, I didn't realize that, and so on and so forth. But but I, I want to I want to mention Two something things, there. Before about, you move on, before you move yeah. on, I want to comment about that. And, and I experienced that myself. Number one, as a young firefighter in eleven truck, a lot of guys were studying. We had our, most firehouses build construct a study room. For the guys to study. This is on duty in the firehouse, a study room. When you're done with housework, when you're done with preparing a meal, you know, obviously fires and runs and everything comes first. But when those are over, guys are up there all night long in the study room. Some places would go and buy their own copy machine in the study room so guys can make copies of changes and stuff like that. But the point is, guys spend a lot of time studying. And then in a place where there's a lot of students, and that was very com common in the FDMY as well, study houses. Lot of students, lot, 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 you'd go somewhere, and, and of the 25 firemen in the engine, 18 of them are studying for lieutenant. Half the <laughs> lieutenants didn't know the stuff that the firemen knew. You know, it was great being an officer in a place where the guys were studying because you say, hey, guys, how many squirts do I put in a, in a mailbox for the, of a dry chemical extinguisher? And the guy's like, it's one, two, one. One squirt, wait two minutes, give it another squirt. You know what I'm saying? Like, the guys were all sharp on it. And one final word on that, there was a deputy in the 7th Division where Jay Jonas just retired from, where I worked as the captain, 48. Um, you'd walk into the deputy's office at 11 o'clock at night and the deputy would be at, the, at his desk reading firefighting procedures, just brushing up a little bit, just reading on maybe looking at a change that just been done. This is a guy that's never going to study again, never going to take another test. He's a deputy chief of the department. And there's a guy 1130 at night just reviewing, looking at ladder street tenements or looking at engines one, maybe looking up something that happened on a job that day, you know? So th that's the one thing that makes my heart make my heart just grow. The guys in the FDNY, everybody, from firefighter to chief of department, but the officers in the FDNY truly loved the job and, and truly really paid attention to it. And everything you're studying to get promoted was was wonderful because it was all the stuff you really had to use, at least most of it, to, to do the job as well. Well, and, 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 I, and I, I want to I want to mention two quick things. Again, you always make me think of stuff when you're when you're when you're going over your points. Um, one is, and when I when I said before, John, you know, it, it, I kind of hinted and it made me think of it right when I said, well, I may not want to pursue one day, but I'm still going to study. And I've always told people when somebody says, ah, I didn't do so good, well, I really wasn't trying this time, or I wasn't, you know, I don't believe that. If you if, first of all, if you're not going to be serious and give it 100 percent, then don't take the promotional exam. Don't even, you know what? If you're if you're not if you're not gonna, you, you know, you know, I'm going with this, guys. Ah, well, you know, it didn't happen. Well, you know, I, I, I didn't give it my. And I'm like, really, you, you were defeated before you even started, you know. Right. So I tell people, John, be serious. If you're, if you're gonna, if you're gonna study to promote, study and go after it like you're gonna finish number one, not number two, number one. I don't care if there's ten openings, you're still going to score number one. And you know who was serious. Coming. You know who the serious students were, at least in my job and the companies I was in by what the guy yeah. showed up to. Now, if it was a line of duty funeral and stuff like that, they would put the books down and, and, and go with the job. But a lot of stuff they wouldn't show up for. All of a sudden, they're having a baseball game, a softball game. Like, where's, where's Smithwick? Yep, he's studying. Test is only another nine months away. He's already cutting off going to softball games and company dinners, you know? So you can measure a guy's seriousness about studying and his, and his dedication by what he would give up to stay home and study. And, and when you when you're, again, when you're talking about seriousness, this is the other one too. Guys would come in my office. You've heard me say this before. They come in, they go, Hey chief, you got a second? And I go, yeah, what's up? Uh, do you know when you're going to post the dates for the captain's exam? Yeah. Yeah. But in a couple of weeks. Why? Well, cause I, I, I want to, I want to go ahead and start studying. And I'm like, the reading list, the materials to study, the whole process has been posted for six years. The only thing that's changed is the addition of maybe a couple books, you know, John Norman's newest fire officer handbook attack or whatever. You, you mean you're going to start, you know, I, I tell people, look, there are some people truly that go, they turn the corner and go, you know what, it's time for me to get into this and start studying. I understand that. But you should already have like, highlighter in the books you should already have your own books you should have like page marks dog-eared little different color things 
you should be cracking the binder for the first time, unless this is the first time you thought about promoting. To, for a guy to walk in and go, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm waiting to see when they post a day so I'm going to start studying. You should have been studying a long time ago, right? And here's another point. We used to call that the bibliography. I think that's actually what it was called on at the yeah. Bob of Water when it came out. Yeah. We always told the guy. So you know what? You, you would always take the last lieutenant's test bibliography and just look at that. And it's going to be the exact same thing unless they do some dramatically crazy change. It's going to be the same bibliography. Five final procedures, ladders one through six, engine operations one, hazmat procedures, hazmat one through seven. And it would basically list safety bulletins, training bulletins, all unit circulars. It would list every single thing, and you would actually separate them out. Things that were not listed, you would put a little mark on them in the book to make sure you didn't read them. And you mentioned highlighting. There was a rule about highlighting. You never, ever highlighted until you read something at least the third time. You read it the first time. You right. always knew the guy that read it the first time and highlighted it. Every page was highlighted because everything seemed important and interesting to him. After you read it a third time and go to a couple of classes and answer some questions, there's stuff you don't have to highlight because you got it. Then there was stuff you started to highlight point. that was a that's little a, more important. That's a great – I've never heard that. That is a great oh, yeah. point. Don't, don't highlight, highlight you read it something three time. times. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that – God, it could, you know, that's me because you and I joke. I, You know, when I, I went to a John Maxwell book signing once, and I said, can you just print all your books in yellow because I'm spending hundreds of dollars on yellow markers. But you're right because there's things that I catch. I go, oh, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. And I'm wasting, you know, instead of things that I really need to emphasize or whatever, I I, I love that. Now, let me ask you this. And, and you mentioned this before. And like I said, I, I've said this three times already. When you start talking, I get all the, I get my, everything starts flowing and I start thinking of stuff. We're talking mentors. And you talked about the deputy up upstairs reading. He's never going to take an exam again, but he's reading procedures, SOGs, SOPs, all that stuff. You know, I used to say this, John, and I think it's in one of, I know it's in one of my programs, I think one of the programs we do together, you know, about leading study groups. And you talked about this. And the FTNY, big departments, very popular for guys to get together. Smaller departments, I'll be honest with you, it's not because there may only be five guys testing for, you know, there, there's a lot of competition for that one position. So they may not, you know, for whatever reason, you call it selfish or not. Or, if only 10 guys are taking a test and they're only going to hire two, you're not yeah. going to sit down with five of them and give them all your information, right? I mean, it just doesn't make any exactly. sense. Exactly. So I, I say this all the time, John. I go, look, if you're the lieutenant or the captain and you already have the position, then you know what you do. You 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 conduct the study groups. If it's not going to be Rick and John and Billy and Timmy and, and Mike, or you know, and, and Lisa, what, what we're going to do now is I'm the lieutenant, you know, and I'm going to go, okay, John, Tommy, Cindy, what are you doing next workday, one o'clock. We're not doing nothing after. Get all your study stuff. Meet me here at the kitchen table. We're shutting the TV off. And you got the flashcards and you got this stuff. You've already got the position, right? right so now right. as a company officer who's already, there's no threats or nothing, you know, you're not in the process. You're actually the one leading the study groups for those candidates, taking the competition away, if you will, from, you know, them studying all together without a leader in a group. And I'm like, you already have the position. And I think it'd make you a better company officer because you're studying that stuff and your best way to learn something you'd be best as a teacher, right? I used to do that when I was a captain of 48 engine. At the time I was running my own school. I can't remember if I was running my own school or if I was still working for the other guy, but I ended up starting my own uh, study promotional uh, school and it doesn't really matter. What I started to do for the guys in my firehouse, and of course it was for no charge, I would bring in some of my old questions that I had written on some of the old topics, questions and choices, questions. So I would bring in a a 10 page, 10 pages stapled together, 10 questions on each page or eight questions on each page. And I would have them in the office, copies of them. Guys would come in and take them. And I'll say, and I'm going to, I'm going to bring the answers in on, on, you know, my next shift. So they would take those home. Like they were taking a 40 or 50 question test. And then when they come in, I'd have the answers the next shift and they'd look it up, not just the answer, the answer and the source and the correction. If there was four ABCDs and you were looking for the best one, B was the best one. And here's why. So, uh, you know, engines one, section 3.2. But then I corrected, I corrected A, C, and D. A should have said 45%, not 35%. C should have said, you know, back of the building instead of, the, you know. So the point is I spent a little bit of time doing that. I didn't create new stuff, but I already had it, but I shared it with the guys in my firehouse that were doing the same thing I was doing. They were meeting a study group on their own. They were probably going to one of the paid schools 
and then they would take in those questions too. And that, and that's the important point is you, it it's just so technically challenging. Every answer sometimes looks correct, and they and they're just like every once in a while you see it on Facebook. What's wrong with the picture? And you're looking, 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 saying, "What is wrong?" With, that's how these questions were, except it was in word format, you know. And and you realize that's why it's so easy to write a seventy nine or an eighty five, and then everybody else writes ninety five or ninety seven. And there's guys that that write in the heart between ninety five and one hundred every time they take a test. Of course, they put the time, in, you know. Well, that's the difference between Lieutenant or Captain John Salka helping the guys, and you got the other guy who was reading his golf magazine. It doesn't. That's the difference between a Henry Topol. And you know who I'm going to talk about, Lieutenant Bill Allen, who we talked my Lieutenant Bill Allen, same department. Just being around that guy made me want to be better. Just being around him made me want to be a better firefighter. Where the other guy's waving a checkbook in front of me, telling this is the this is the only book. While I'm studying, instead of sitting down and going, okay, where, where are you weak? What do you, what, you know, where are you struggling? What, what are you having difficult? Oh, hydraulics is my bad thing. Okay. Let's you know what I'm saying? Maybe I could show you a couple of tricks and all that. So, so let me, like let me, you, me you, you want to be a better man. <laughs> <laughs> Make me want to be a better man <laughs> from, uh, what was that? Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson. Hunt, the, yeah. the, um, uh, Oh, I'm afraid that'll come to me in a minute. Anyway, that that as good as it gets. But but that, so that being said, we've been talking about like when did you start? When did you start thinking about promoting? We we talked about that, and you have to kind of make your mind up there, and it'll it sometimes it'll fall into your lap. And some of you, like John, already said he thought about it when he got hired. When he wanted to be promoted, and then what did you do to prepare the studying? And the, you know, it's not just I'm gonna get the book or the books open, read them a month before the test, and think I'm gonna be ready. You know, how much effort do you put in having those mentors that are willing to step up and help you study, you know, get to the reading list ahead of time. Be serious. If you're going to enter into the process, enter into it, going crazy thousand miles an hour, help the others. So now, John, you know, now you, in, to, for those that are getting ready, they're also playing the acting officer. You know, I've said this is let me advance it for the chiefs. When you get an interim chief. And, you know, you and I help a lot of people find new chiefs and stuff. And you go, so you're the interim chief. Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to keep the seat warm. And I'm like, what? This is like a great – you have the best assessment in the world. If you're, the, if you're actually going for the position, you don't sit there and keep the seat warm. You go in and you try to, to affect change. Not crazy stuff, not move mountains, but good positive things. Because it's actually you, – you, you get the best of both worlds. You get to go through the assessment and you're actually doing it there. But as the as an acting officer, this is your chance to role play for real, to take it serious. And we talk about this in class all the time, about making the personality change where you're no longer in the club. And and some of the senior firefighters that are going to be going to be company officer, you can see this, right, John? There's there's a mature, that fire service maturity, not not on a boo boo, but they're already playing the role. You know, I mean, there's no they don't go back to be the jackass the next work day and then get up in the front seat and now they're tooting the horn and giving orders, they begin to really play the role, right? I mean, you, you know, there's people you've talked about that as a firefighter, when they sat up in the front seat, the only difference was the seatbelt they were putting on. It, there was no difference because they already, they already are a good boss without even having the trumpet on their helmet. Right. Oh, absolutely. And, and it, it's almost like there's two separate issues. The one issue was, is acting. And the only acting I ever did my whole career was when I was a captain. And the FDNY has a – we really don't use acting officers, but we do use them as battalion chiefs. Captains act as battalion chiefs. Battalion chiefs do not work all the time. If there's an opening for a battalion chief, guy gets hurt or sick or vacation. If there's a guy built into the system that, that's surplus that will cover his vacation, that's fine. But if not, sometimes it's left open for the night, and they just pick the senior captain in the battalion, tell him, you got it. Joe Principio, Joe. You're, uh, you're acting in a 1-8 tonight. Okay, he walks down the hallway, and now he sits in that office for the rest of the night. Obviously, he goes out on the runs as a battalion. There's a white helmet that says acting battalion chief on it. And they hire some captain from somewhere else to go sit in his office for the night because now he's not there. So the captains get the right. overtime for the chief's opening. Chiefs don't get it. And now you got a captain. Now, a guy like Joe Principio, I don't know if he did a 1,000, but he did hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. He was a captain for 25 years. And then some guys are a captain for 25 days. And he's a senior captain one night, and they make him an acting battalion chief. 
the guy isn't really even a real captain yet. And now they're making him an acting battalion chief. So I am not a big fan. I have never been a big fan of acting officers in any rank for any reason because most guys are acting. They are acting when they're in that spot, even if they do it. And you've said this many times. You could do it 50 times, and it, you still don't feel the same pressure. You still don't feel the same right. responsibility of an officer as so a guy who's sure. up there getting paid to do the job, who's who knows it's his responsibility. You know, um, so, so you change that shirt. So that's important. What, what I can tell you was good about acting, and I hated, I hated when I was a captain because I love being a captain of forty eight engine, and I hated when they called me up and said, "Oh, you're going to be, a, you're going to act in a one eight tonight." I'm like, "Oh, well, not tonight. You know, tomorrow night when you come to work." <laughs> However, I must tell you, when I did it, number one, I was already studying for battalion chief, so this was this was familiar territory. It was somewhere where I was heading, and I did get a chance at least to experience, you know quote, unquote, the life of the battalion chief, the type of situations that he has to do, you know, a little bit of the paperwork, but you didn't even mess around with the paperwork too much because you know what? If you didn't know what you were doing, you're just going to mess up the paperwork for the guy that's working tomorrow that's in a battalion that really knows right. whether it's at, you know, monthly reports or whatever they are, evaluations. But you still could get a taste of the job. Going out on the runs, everybody on runs, they couldn't, they didn't care if it was an acting battalion chief from 48 engine or if it was the, the battalion commander of the 18th battalion, it's like five, four, one, eight. Yeah, we got a smoke addition in here, chief. We might need. And all of a sudden, you're doing the job of a battalion chief, which I found very, very interesting and rewarding. Other than the fact that I was getting, you know, getting pulled out of my own company for the night. So there are some advantages well, to the acting. And you know, and, and unlike the, the FDNY or Chicago or you know LA or something like that, there are, there are more smaller departments that have to have the acting officers. Oh yeah. So it goes back. It goes back to what you and I've been talking about this show. Prepare early, man, because this is your chance to make a difference. This is your chance. You and I have reviewed line of duty deaths where the battalion chief was the captain they pulled off the truck. The captain, you know, the, the lieutenant on the, the, the truck is the, the lieutenant they pull off the engine and the firefighter. And in, in some cases, there's it's been a multiple line of duty death. A lot of it goes back to who was in charge. It wasn't just one. The whole chain got yanked up, you know, firefighter to acting lieutenant to acting captain, captain to acting BC, and so on and so forth. And it goes back to what you and I were saying earlier. If you're not preparing earlier to do this stuff in your career and you're going to act up, you're actually a hazard to the, to the guys and gals. If you're not studying, if you're not preparing, if you're not, if you're not playing the role, like we said, and, and not going back to being the jackass, but you know what? And I'll say this, John, if, if, if you're a fire, and I'll say this to our viewers, if you're a firefighter and you're starting to study for lieutenant, don't worry about what they're saying. When they walk by and they go, you see, Salk is already studying to be a lieutenant. Who gives a shit? You know, are they going to say, look at, he's reading another book from Colin Powell. No, who cares? You know, I don't care what they think. If you want, folks, if you want to study and prepare early and get those books out, to make yourself better, there's a lot of green-eyed monsters out there, man. There's a lot of jealousy that goes on that people are threatened or whatever. Don't worry about that. You do what's best for you because this is not about – John and I have said this hundreds of times. This ain't about delivering pizzas. We get we don't get any do-overs in the fire service. And sometimes the person riding the front seat is the one – quite often, you and I wrote about it in Chapter 1 in our leadership book, John – the company officer is the one that has the greatest impact on keeping her people healthy, safe, and alive. And it doesn't say the acting company officer or the regular. It says the company officers, whoever's riding that front seat, has that impact. And if they're not going to study, buddy, they are a hazard to the crew, right? Right. Absolutely. And studying and studying is, is, is a plus for anybody, anytime. Even a young guy who says, you know what? I'm thinking about taking a test. I'll see how I feel next year when I open up the filing. I'm going to start reading right now and seeing if – See if the material is, you know, if I can handle it. I'm a young guy yet, and, you know, he's still benefiting by it. He's still learning all the tactics of the job, what tools to carry, how to get to the roof, who's first do and second do on a shaft fire. So he's still learning. It's not like wasted energy that he's never going to use. Almost all the almost all the books that you read in the FDMY, and I, and I must believe that it's probably the same for everybody. They're good, for, they're good for all the ranks. You study in my job, lieutenant, captain is almost the same exam. Obviously, there's some captain's questions there. Because he's a company commander right. and he has some responsibilities maybe that a lieutenant doesn't have. And chief, it changes more dramatically. But you're still studying the same stuff, maybe just the different the different responsibilities of the different ranks of officers, you know, at a tenement fire or at a house fire. Oh. Well, all right, let me ask you this. Um, we're gonna we're gonna move to wrap this up. We try to 
for our viewers uh, and listeners, uh, John and I will shoot for the 35 to 40, 45 minute show. So it's, uh, you know, it's good for you to listen to while you're working out and driving to and from. So we always do this, John. Lesson, we're talking about prepare to ride a front seat. Lessons learned that you had in the process as well as what advice do you have for those that are preparing to move up? For those who are preparing to right seat, what do you, what does John Salka have for them advice-wise? As far as being a company officer, I mean, it, it's the stuff that we really already covered um, individually. Each, but but put together as a package, you got you got to make a decision. You want to be a company officer. You can't just do it. Can't go through the motions because it's not going to work. So once you decide you want to be a company officer, you did it and I did it. You talk about Bill Allen, I talk about Joe Callen, and, and he's like, you got to have some mentors. You got to look at some of these guys that you work with. I was looking two, three ranks up. I was watching guys like Joe Callen and guys like Tom Kennedy when I was a fireman, saying, "Wow, look at these guys." I didn't even know. I didn't even know Tom Kennedy when he was a captain. I never knew him. I first met him when he was a battalion chief. I mean, I've known him my whole career now. I'm going to hopefully see him sh- shortly this week, but. And once you get a couple of good mentors, a couple of solid mentors that you work with, whether it's regularly or whether it's just occasionally, then then you have a good you have a good target, you have a good roadmap to follow. And and we have talked about it. I can recite the names of the guys that are your mentors and the stories about them that, that you tell all the time because they made such an impact on you. You know. So once you have good mentors and you start studying, you got to be dedicated. You got to put the time in, and you got to and you got to really want it. And what's good about that is is you can't fake really wanting it. Either you really want it or you don't. And if you don't, you'll be at the softball game instead of studying. You'll be at the company party or you'll be out with the guys on check night drinking till 2 o'clock in the morning. I used to pick my check up and leave and come home and and, and study. My wife was a nurse. She'd go to work at 11 o'clock at night, and I'd be home with the kids, Pat and Johnny on the backs in, in, the, in the crib while I was reading. And I would read until I heard the music for Hill Street Blues. Remember that Hill Street Blues music? <laughs> when I heard that music yeah. playing on the TV – I turned the light off and I was done studying for the night and I would watch Hill Street Blues and, and, and have a beer, you know? So there's different ways of doing it. Everybody does it differently. That's how it worked for me. Well, it's about, uh, you know, being serious about the whole process. Like, like we said earlier, folks, uh, to, our, to our listeners, to our viewers, um, it's about being serious with the process. Don't take it lightly. Go into it 100%. Don't go into it half ass. Start studying early in your career. Prepare early. Get ready. It's, if anything, it's just gonna make you be a better firefighter. And when you're when you're the acting officer, don't play the role. Be the role. Be the person. Be serious about it. You know, there's that fire service maturity thing that that that's going to occur in your career, and you'll realize it. If you're already a lieutenant or captain, how about you help the guys and gals that are in your company? Help them. Do lead the study groups for them. Be the person that helps them prepare. Eliminate that competition. Those smaller departments by you stepping up. And providing them with the information, help the others around you. To, to again, to the, to those looking, get the reading list going now. Start looking at it now. Start looking at the books. I love what you said. Don't highlight till after the third time you read it. That is, I've never heard that. That's perfect. But uh, you paint the page uh, oh, in your books. Oh, exactly. Hey, John, if they want to get a hold of you, great email, buddy. Chief John Salka at gmail dot com, and I'm Chief Lasky at gmail dot com, and. and uh, uh, we want to thank you for, for joining us with, with our, our Fire Engineering Podcast, The Command Post. You can catch our other podcasts, Old School, as well. And again, a reminder, the third Wednesday of every month, we go live at noon Central Time with our Hump Day Hangout, the Issues and Challenges, and tomorrow's, or the future fire, the, the, the fire service, or today's fire service, sorry. And then we hope we get to see at FDIC this year. We always end all of our shows um, with this, with this, with this one phrase, and that's in closing. Please keep the men and women armed forces in your thoughts and prayers, and remember this, please. Never forgetting means just that. Never forgetting. Thank you. Be safe. God bless you. We'll catch you next time. Oh my! Everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of explosion four. Fire through the roof of the fire building the entire rear section. Now remember, give it up for the payday. It's in the count for. Okay. Now we're going to have to get back in here we got a fire one and a half story single family dwelling fire shown from the second floor give me a second alarm on this the top floor i got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby commercial building uh, a lot of fire a lot of smoke go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this got people on the front fire escape here with windows circuit below them we need somebody up there yeah let them know we got a job i'm pulling up now Second alarm, I got a one-story single-family frame, heavy fire showing from the attic. Some of you are all here, 
is we got one line stretch, fire and fourth floor, second line being stretched, primary stretches are underway. The Fire Store, equipping protectors with passion. Every decision the Fire Store makes is about you, the customer. They wouldn't be where they are today without you, and they don't take that lightly. They understand that having the right gear can mean the difference between life and death. The goal is to get you the gear you need, when you need it, at prices you can afford. Visit them at thefirestore.com for everything but the truck and shop the family of brands that include Streamlight, MSA, Lion, Fleer, and more.